Just finished my slides. <laughs> so uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, rethinking responsive building techniques using SAS, Drupal themes, and modules. Um, this is basically the one idea that I've been thinking about for the past year. Um, if uh, you don't know who I am, I'm John Alvin Wilkins. Um, I'm a core maintainer, which is actually quite easy to become. All you have to do is submit a patch on Drupal.org, like everybody here should. Um, and uh, I'm also the maintainer of the Zen theme. And uh, people ask me why Zen isn't responsive yet. And uh, I've been doing a lot of sort of preparatory work in order to have Zen be the best possible base theme for responsive designs. And that includes all of these ideas that I'm talking about today. Um, actually, probably Zen uh, version 5 will be out, I'm hoping, within uh, the next month, um, now that I've got all this stuff um, done. So I'm uh, really excited to give this talk today. Um, this is the slide they told us to put in here. I'm not sure why. Uh, <laughs> ah, I have to remember not to pace. I like to walk around, but uh, I don't have a mic today. Um, when you start doing responsive designs, um, one of the first ways that you do it, especially with Drupal, is to sort of do region-based layout, right? You're positioning all of your regions, like your, your content region, your sidebars and stuff. And uh, this is an image from uh, Luke Rubluski's uh, recent article from last week, actually. Um, and uh, he talked about some patterns that he was seeing in responsive design. And uh, you can see that. Uh, over here on the right here is sort of the traditional Drupal layout with the content in the middle and then left and right sidebars. Um, and then he sees uh, some of the, the secondary sidebars sort of dropping down and then becoming sort of more traditional single column layout. Um, this uh, actually, uh, we had a mobile initiative sprint uh, just a couple days ago. And one of the things that we got done is we actually made this the pattern that's used in Stark for Drupal 8. Um, so you'll be seeing this. Um, and, and this is perfectly fine if what you want to do is region-based layouts. Uh, but there's really two problems with this. Uh, and that's one is that it's boring, right? <laughs> Luke saw this as a pattern because he sees lots and lots of sites doing this exact same way of responsiveness. So. You know, you, you can do it, and you can build a site really quickly using this technique, but it's going to look like a lot of other designs. Uh, and the other problem with it is actually it's kind of dangerous, especially in Drupal. So the, the issue here is uh, when you, you think about building a mobile site, the content is the most important thing. So you put your content in the middle or at the very top of your page, hopefully, and then you think, OK, in order to make this responsive, I've got to add some blocks, right? So that I can have these extra regions so that I can move stuff around inside the other regions. Uh, and this is a way of like basically filling up the page with extra blocks just so you can make it responsive to be on mobile. Uh, this is kind of crazy. Uh, <laughs> this is not how you build a responsive site. You know, just fill it out with whatever. Uh, the way that you should be looking at your site is to be thinking about mobile first. Now, uh, who here has heard about the mobile first technique? Fantastic. This is an intermediate session. You should all be raising your hand. Um, if not, there's good news because uh, Luke Rubluski is giving a, a uh, keynote on Thursday. It's excellent. He should be talking about this. Um, but when you think about mobile first and designing for the mobile layouts first before you start designing the layouts for the larger screen sizes. Really what we're talking here is content first. It's the most important thing on your site. That's why your users are here, and that's why it's also users first. These are all basically the same thing or the same idea. You should be thinking about your users. Um, and, and I would just like to say if uh, Luke, Luke's talk on Thursday is, uh, you know, first thing in the morning, but uh, you should definitely, you know, don't drink that much. Uh, even if you do, <laughs> drag your butt out of bed, <laughs> even if you only had two hours sleep, and go see him. It should be excellent. Um, 
So when we start thinking about uh, Drupal sites, uh, content first, um, what does that mean for Drupal sites? Um, if you're thinking about sort of the traditional region-based layouts, content first it just means that your content region goes first in the layout. It's not that exciting, but actually if you start thinking about Drupal 7, there's a huge opportunity there to really focus on content first. Um, and that's because Drupal 7, of course, has fields, right? It has very structured content. So each of our individual fields um, can be part of the layout. We don't just have to move the entire node around as one solid object. We can have our fields be part of the layout. Um, Field-based responsive layouts means responsive content. Um, if you followed any of the uh, sort of mobile gurus and their talks, they talk about CMS as this big black box where users stick all of their content inside a WYSIWYG and then you can't actually make it responsive because they've put all these tables and stuff like that. That's not true with Drupal if you've built the site correctly. You have your structure content and we can access these fields and make them responsive. This is, this is just really exciting to me. <laughs> um, a great example of responsive content is actually Palantir.net's website. Uh, this is uh, the company that I work for, um, and I was, I was really, uh, <laughs> really glad that I was able to work on their site and help make it responsive. There was a team of people, designers, um, themers, and uh, it, it was just a lot of fun. And uh, here's the, uh, yeah. So here's uh, what this, this one page looks like on like a traditional desktop. We have sort of our main image, our main content down here. And these are some additional fields. And you can see that they're in sort of these other sidebars. Um, and this is what it looks like on desktop. Uh, and uh, yeah. Here's what a sort of a tablet looks like. So you can see the image now spans the entire width and all of the fields that were here have moved over here and it's in two columns. And now this slightly smaller, so now our content sort of fills the entire width. Uh, but actually we have secondary fields which are very narrow, so we still stick those in two sidebars. And then of course once we get down to the traditional mobile, everything's in one column. This is fun, this is great. This is exactly what I wanna see everybody's website become. Um, because I know that as a community we'll be able to pull off some really stunning responsive sites using field-based responsive layouts. So how do we get there? Let's start with fields. Drupal 7, I know you love the field TPL, right? Who loves the field TPL? Yeah, <laughs> most people don't love the field TPL. It's, it's great concept with a really crappy implementation. Uh, <laughs> Drupal 7 assumes the worst. Uh, and basically what it's assuming is a multi-value plain text field with a label. That's the use case that it built the feed TPL to handle. Uh, how many people have multi-value te plain text fields? There's not that many. That's really, really an edge case. And yet that's the primary, that's the reason why we have the field TPL looking the way it is. So let's look at it and remind ourselves of just how awful this is, right? So we have this wrapping div where our class field name is, a bunch of other classes on here. Our, our label is wrapped in a div, uh, and for extra awfulness, there's a colon and a non-breaking space in there. Um, then we have each of our individual fields wrapped in a div, and then all of the, the values are then wrapped in an additional div uh, and so we end up with like one, two, three nesting deeps just to get to the content of the field uh, plus an extra one if you happen to have a label. I'll just let you look at that for a little bit. <laughs> I'm gonna get some water. So, I started looking at Zen saying, okay, how can I fix this? And I realized that I couldn't. Uh, and the reason why is because as a distributed or as a contributed theme, 
as just something that's ready-made and I hand over to you and let you start using it, I have no idea what the semantics are of your site. And I can never know at the theme level what is inside your field. I can get a little hint based on the field type, whether it's a text or an image or stuff like that, but most of the semantics, no clue. It's not possible. So the only way to go about fixing this problem is with a module and to have the site creator specify what the semantics are of each of your fields. And uh, that's how the fences module was built. Um, we had a Palantir on site uh, last year, and uh, we had uh, Jen Simmons, myself, Pat Teglia, uh, Nate uh, Stridinger, and uh, Greg Leroux worked on uh, building a sort of model for what the fences module should do and how it goes about the easiest way for a site uh, builder to specify the semantics, sort of get out of its ways, and then always use those semantics no matter where on the site. So, uh, and by the way, this is sort of a pun. Fences are the wrappers around fields. That's how we got with the name. Um, so, as opposed to what Drupal 7 does, Fences assumes the norm, what you usually do with fields. Um, and that's that most of your fields already have markup inside them, right? So you don't need very many wrappers, if any at all. So uh, there's actually maybe about 30 different TPLs in the fences module, which we'll talk about in a minute. But uh, the basic sort of pattern for those, those uh, template files are this, right? So our label is inside a header. This makes sense, right? H3. Um, and then uh, all of our values are inside a single wrapper, which is the element that you specified, the HTML5 element that you've specified. Um, so this is the pattern. Um, for if you decide that you want a UL, though, it's, there's an exception here, of course. It wraps each of your values in an LI, and then each of the values get wrapped in a UL. That makes sense. But this is our basic pattern for any sort of HTML5 element. Let's look at some screenshots here. Um, traditional Manage Fields page. Um, let's go and click on Edit on one of these things. And at the very bottom of sort of the uh, field settings, I can't remember the label of the, this particular field set, but at the bottom there it says wrapper markup. This is the only UI that F Fences module exposes because it's the only UI that it needs in order to let the site builder do what it needs to do. Uh, you can see here the default is generic container only used as a last resort, right? <laughs> uh, it is what it is. So let's see what happens when we sort of click on that pull down menu. You can see there's a giant list of HTML5 elements, and they are organized by whether they're block level, lists, you know, a phrasing type. Uh, we have, you know, a, the div, of course, uh, pre, uh, the pre-code together. That means we use two elements to wrap it. This is a sort of common HTML5 pattern for putting code uh, on uh, inside a field. Um, menus, unordered lists, ordered lists, um, bold, italics, Insertion, keyboard, mark. I had no idea what you guys might use. I think most of these are completely crazy ideas. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> but I don't know your use case. So I went through the entire HTML5 spec and picked out all the ones that you could possibly use. There's no body tag in here. There's no HTML tag in here. But everything that you could possibly use to wrap a piece of content is in this list. And I would like to point out, actually, that the very first thing here is really useful. No markup, no wrapping HTML at all. Your body field, for example, already has lots of HTML in it. It's got paragraphs and all that stuff. You usually don't need a wrapping element around the main body field. So why add one? Just select no markup. And uh, basically what happens is the, the uh, template file that gets used is, still has that H3 if you want to put you know, a label on it. Uh, you wouldn't want to do that for the body, obviously. But uh, you could still have H3 and then the label. 
Uh, and then it just prints the values with no wrapping at all. No classes. But this is really useful. Let's look at the, uh, the bottom of this list here. Um, you can see it even has Ruby. Uh, this is a Japanese and Chinese thing, uh, HTML5 markup in order to show the pronunciation of particular characters. Like I said, I put everything in here. <laughs> uh, then we have sectioning, headers, address, asides, uh, section, navigation, everything. Um, this means that as you build the site, you add a field and you just pick the markup that you want to use for that field. And uh, I would say, uh, when in doubt, go naked. Right? Use the no wrapper. Just have H3 and the values. Um, if you figure out that you need a wrapper later, then you go in and choose a wrapper. Choose the one that makes sense, right? Uh, the other nice thing about fences is that it's everywhere and it's automatic. Like I said, the only UI is on the field itself. Um, it automatically, it's used for every single view mode because you're specifying the semantics of the field and the semantics of the field don't change depending on the view mode that you've chosen, the way you've decided to display the content. The semantics of the field are the same. Also works in views. Uh, we've added a couple of views hooks in there so that uh, if you use uh, um, if you use display modes or view modes with inside views, all of this stuff works naturally. And basically, anywhere that the field TPL is used in Drupal, if any new module comes along and decides, hey, I'm going to use a field TPL for this particular use case, because it's a field TPL, fences will be able to put the semantic wrapper around it. Um, the reason why I put this first and the reason why I spent some time on it here is because it's really important that your site is very lean and Drupal 7's fields are not lean by default. So I really feel like getting the right semantic markup, lean semantic markup is essential. Uh, the way this actually works is with the theme hook suggestions. Um, how many people here know what uh, theme hook suggestions are? Fair amount of you. I I'm not going to go into it, um, but basically there's a, a, a page on Drupal.org in the documentation that talks about theme hook suggestions. This is how the magic works. And basically, because they're no standard theme hook suggestions, you're able to override the TPL that fences use for a particular use case. Let's say uh, you've got uh, uh, you're doing like a carousel on the home page. So you've got a special view mode just for that and you need to tweak the markup just a little bit just so the jQuery hooks into it properly. You can override it and use theme hook suggestions to override it just for that use case. Fences works as normal. The, the, uh, uh, your suggestions will override what Fences says. So uh, yeah, so smart custom markup that you get to define. Um, this, is, this is the way Drupal 7 works I, I highly recommend if you don't know what theme hook suggestions are, go and learn about them. So one of the things I want to talk about fences is that field collection and fences work together really great. Um, when you go and add a, a new field and you have field collection installed, you can, it's a type of field. So I was just saying I'm going to create a field collection. A field collection is basically say I'm going to take a bunch of fields and sort of put them together and treat them as one field. So I've created a field collection, which is a grouping of fields I'm going to define. Um, because it's a, you know, a normal field, we can specify the wrapper for the collection. And in this case, we've chosen figure. If you know HTML5, figure goes around like an image and a caption, right? Um, and so if we go in and go into our structure pages, field collections is right here. It allows you to um, look at the field collections that you've created on any type of entity, like a node or a user. Um, and then you can manage the fields kind of similarly the way that uh, nodes work. You can see you get a very similar page here. This is just for this, uh, this uh, field collection that we just created. We're going to add an image and we're going to add a caption. And these are just uh, image and long text fields. And again, those are normal fields too because they're basically nested fields. So you can configure them to uh, use the, uh, uh, you know, the,
config caption, for example, you would want to use, oops, too, back, too much. For the, uh, the long text description, you would want to use uh, fig caption element around that. And then for the image, you actually don't need a wrapper for that, so you would specify no wrapper. And that's sort of the traditional way that you would create a figure using HTML5. So field collection and uh, fences go together uh, really great. I love it. That's right, I got it. Just looking at the time, it's 2.37, two okay. Yeah. So let's look at uh, the layout markup. So we've looked at fields. Now let's start looking at the layout. This is one of the most interesting things, and I gave a talk in uh, DrupalCon London, and uh, this was a thing that people had lots and lots of questions about, and I only had like one slide on it, and like, yeah, we just use uh, CTools uh, layouts. And people were like, what, what? And there were like huge follow-up questions. So let's talk about it. Custom CTools layouts. Uh, this is the documentation for CTools layouts. These are, are really powerful. Um, you notice that I'm not talking about, uh, I'm talking about the chaos tools suite. I'm not talking about panels. I'm talking about CTools. Um, there's an important distinction here because CTools layouts, uh, they, they, the layouts used to be part of panels, but they got moved to a lower level inside the CTools. And because of that, other modules can now use these layouts as well. For example, display suite uses CTools. So if you create a CTools layout, you can either use it in panels or you can use it in display suite. So uh, step one, it's, it's pretty basic, really. We're going to go through it pretty quickly here, but you should get a good idea of how to do it. Add this to your themes info file. Basically, that says, and it still says panels in, in there, even though it's C-tools. I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's the way it is. Um, and basically, you're specifying the subdirectory of your theme where you're going to put all of these custom layouts you're about to build. OK? Really simple, but if you forget that, like I, I was trying to build a, all these screenshots and I kept, I forgot to do step one. So I'm like, why isn't this working? I cleared the cache like eight times. Um, <laughs> don't forget that. Uh, step two, uh, add these files to your themes. This is the minimal files that you need for a particular layout. Uh, you've got uh, inside your layouts directory, you create a, 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 another directory, which is the sort of machine name of this particular layout. Uh, and then you have to have that same machine name, dot .inc, okay? Um, and then you'll need to create a TPL, and you've got to convert any underscores into dashes. Um, and then a CSS um, and some dashes there, right? Now, the dot .inc file, that's where you specify, um, hey, we're going to use this TPL. Hey, we're going to use this CSS. Um, here's the regions that I'm going to add to the TPL. Um, I'm not going to show you the innards of that file just because you can look it up in the docs and it's, it's a boring slide anyway. Um, there's some other things that you can specify. You can specify a sort of custom icon for this layout so that when you're selecting layouts inside the various modules, C tools or display suite, it'll show the custom icon. Um, and then you can have separate TPL for the sort of back end versus the front end. So uh, this is the back end CSS and the uh, uh, front end CSS. Step three, edit all the files. Uh, yeah, that's all I'm going to show you. Uh, <laughs> look up it on the documentation. You see exactly how to do it. Um, and I'm going to start showing you some of the uh, configuration. So we're going to use Display Suite uh, to uh, configure our nodes to use a particular custom layout that we just built. Um, so you go into Structure uh, and uh, where is it? Oh, no, we're already, yeah, go into structure and then into display suite. And then here's where we can specify layout. Um, this is what, uh, this is what they sort of, oh, yeah. Yeah, we get to pick which we're, what we're going to lay out first. So we're going to go down and pick a no node. And uh, you're going to see sort of the traditional fields that you can, for a normal view mode. We're going to pick the layout. And uh, there's going to be a pop-down menu that shows all of the layouts that are available for C-tools, or sorry, for panels, or for display suite, plus the custom one you just built. So we're going to select that. Um, and then suddenly, instead of the normal just these are shown or hidden, we have regions now. 
So I've put these particular fields inside these regions on the uh, manage display setting. Um, and that's how Display Suite works as far as putting fields inside of the TPLs. And um, the, uh, the, the contents of your TPL is just sort of very similar to the page TPL, right? So you've got some, some variables that print out the regions that you specify. And one of the super nice things about creating custom layouts like this is you can reuse them, right? Because you specified the sort of structure for it, you can just take that custom layout you built and use it on a new site, you know, and just keep repeating. Uh, it's, it's a really great way to, you know, reuse your work. Um, I realized when I did the pitch for this session uh, that I put a lot of things in it, uh, sort of over-promised because I've only got an hour. I think I have about eight hours of material. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I, I decided I'm going to, for front-end performance, which I think is extremely important, and that's why I'm not going to show any slides on it. Um, I'm punting, uh, uh, but fortunately, right after this, Matt Frina is giving a, an entire hour just about front-end performance, so he can talk about it more than I can in two or three slides. So uh, do go see Matt Frina's 345, uh, which is right after the break after this session. So let's talk about some tangents. Um, responsive images, yeah, I know I said I wasn't going to talk about front-end performance, but there's a couple things that you would just lynch me if I didn't talk about. So responsive images. Uh, at DrupalCon London, I said, hey, we don't know what to do here, so let's all figure it out together. And people were throwing, like, tomatoes. They were not pleased with me. <laughs> they thought I was going to pull some magic rabbit out of the back pocket. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I have not written a responsive image module because I'm hoping the community comes up with something. And there's good news. They've started to, right? Right now, uh, I feel like the best one is the adaptive image module. Um, this is uh, based on Matt Wilcox's adaptive images technique, which uh, is, a, is the, the best technique that I think will work with Drupal. There are several techniques um, in sort of the, for doing responsive images in the sort of greater web design community, and none of them are perfect. But this is the, Matt Wilcox's idea is the one I think would integrate best with Drupal, and so we've got somebody who's, who's integrating that into a Drupal module, and I really feel like that's gonna be, that right, right now, that is the best solution. But there are other modules out there. For example, Borealis is a new one just popped up like last week as far as the first time I saw it. Um, I don't know anything about it. <laughs> uh, but you can sort of start to evaluate these modules yourself and figure out, um, because this is going to be constantly changing for the next several months before there's sort of a winner in the Drupal sphere of which module is best. And the best way that you evaluate these is understanding the sort of base problem, the, the problem space. And Jason Grigsby had, has written uh, like a series of three or four blog posts that perfectly describe what is the problem with responsive images. If you haven't read these, go read them. These are fantastic. I, by the way, if, uh, you don't have to frantically type the URLs down. I'm going to post the uh, slides. Uh, as soon as I finish this session, I'll, I'll post the slides up. I couldn't do it before because I hadn't finished them until, yeah. OK, so um, read Jason Grigsby's article. It's really good. Now let's talk about natural versus unnatural breakpoints. Uh, I see a lot of articles talk about 320 pixels, 480 pixels, 768. They're using the, the dimensions of devices like the iPad and iPhone and sort of the you know, 960 traditional desktop sizes, and they're using those as the breakpoints. Break this is kind of a crazy idea, and, and the reason for that is that uh, you are basing your responsive design on the mobile devices that are available right now. And the thing is, by the time you finish developing the site, there's going to be some new hot 
iPad 4, right? <laughs> Whatever it is, is gonna come out and it's gonna be right in between the breakpoints that you specified from the previous devices and it's gonna kinda look like crap because you weren't really thinking about that particular space, right? Don't think about device dimensions when you're thinking about what breakpoints to pick. Try to feel what your content, what your design wants to say about, hey, this is where you should start changing the layout because I look a little goofy over here, right? This is going funky over here. Now's a good, point, now's a good spot to put a breakpoint in so that you can fix those problems, right? And uh, a colleague of mine did a much better summary of, of what I was just describing in this blog post on Palantir.net. And he had a great illustration. So here's the traditional, traditional approach with the sort of device size breakpoints. And instead of putting your breakpoints right there and having the design sort of in between, if, if you still want to think of, if you, you still, you can't get the device sizes out of your head or you know, your boss wants it to absolutely look good on the iPad, instead of putting the breakpoint where the device is, put the device right in the middle of this particular design media query. And your breakpoints then go, you know, bound that device size. This is a really good approach. I, I, I like this. Um, and uh, I, I want to thank, thank Patrick for, for uh, putting that together. Really great. Great idea. Um, oh. And I sort of coined the term sort of natural versus unnatural. Natural breakpoints are the breakpoints that are specified by your design, by your content. Unnatural breakpoints, those are the device breakpoints. Don't do break, unnatural breakpoints. Gutters. Uh, this is another tip that actually Patrick gave me. Um, box sizing border box. I had missed this in the CSS3 spec. Basically, this takes the traditional box model and fixes it so that it finally makes sense. Instead of having the padding and border outside the width, you know, like, okay, I'm gonna put some, some content, I'm gonna put some padding in my box and that's gonna make my box bigger. Doesn't happen in the real world, right? So, <laughs> if you have box size and border box, suddenly the padding goes inside the box, right? Your content goes inside the box. So, the width, now specifies the edge of your border to the other edge of your border. This has huge implications for responsive design. And that's because percentage-based border or gutters suck, <laughs> right? You've got a fluid grid and your all of your sort of columns are based on percentages. And the the space that you want to put inside between these columns, if they're also percentages, they fluctuate so much based on the viewport width that it just is really painful. You end up having, you are wanting to put in a lot of breakpoints just so you can keep the gutter size sort of consistent. This fixes that completely. Just use box size border and then you can specify your padding in pixels, your, which is your, your gutter. You can specify the gutter padding in pixels and then still keep your layout using percentages. One last sort of tangent I want to talk about here is uh, who are your users? I was thinking about this on the airplane ride here. And that, uh, you know, traditionally when you think about who are your users, you start looking at your site statistics, right? And you really need to beware of statistics. Uh, and that's because relying on statistics to tell you who your users are, like, you know, oh, I've got, you know, these smartphones are visiting the site and I've got these desktop browsers visiting the site. Relying on that is a bad idea. It's sort of the, the analogy is basically like building a restaurant and uh, accidentally drywalling over the women's restroom door and not realizing it. And then taking a survey a little while later and going, hey, there's only men visiting the restaurant. 
obviously, I need to cater just to men. There's, those are my users. Uh, <laughs> that's the same issue. And the reason for this is because a lot of mobile devices don't show up on Google Analytics because Google Analytics relies on some semi-complex JavaScript and they don't work on a lot of mobile devices. So you could have a whole bunch of mobile devices going to your site and not show up. And you can also have a whole bunch of mobile sites going to your site and then getting frustrated with how inaccessible your site is. So it's like, hey, there's no place for me to go to the bathroom, right? <laughs> I'm not coming back to this place. <laughs> So don't rely on site statistics. Um, but I'm going to show you some statistics. Um, <laughs> so a lot of people are thinking about iPhone, Android devices. And the thing is that you don't always realize is that Opera is that browser we love to ignore on the desktop. But the company is positioning itself really, really strategically well. They've been talking to mobile device creators for about 10 years now and slowly getting tons and tons of mobile devices using Opera Mini. And you can see that over the past several years here, the number of Opera Mini users has climbed to like 15 million. And this number is just going to keep getting bigger and bigger. So if you think, hey, I'm going to check my responsive site on iPhone and Android, make sure you check it on Opera Mini. That should be the first one you check it on. <laughs> uh, the, the good news is that there's some mobile testing things that you can get. Uh, there's an Opera Mini simulator that's available online. There's also Opera Mini emulator, which is a desktop app, which is really cool. I'm going to show you a screenshot in just a second. And then, of course, iPhone, app, iPad simulators. You've seen lots of these. Android emulator. This thing runs like a dog that's been shot in the leg. It's awful. Uh, it's really slow, but it's the emulator, right? Um, but here's, here's Opera Mini emulator, which is a desktop app uh, which you can download. And uh, you start it up and it says, OK, which, which device do you want to emulate? And there's a huge list of mobile devices that they've included out of the box. And you select the one you want. And I think I did Samsung's Galaxy S1 here. And it's showing you uh, what the Samsung Galaxy looks like. And you can browse your sites using this. And it's a great emulator. Um, even more mobile testing. So mobile emulators and simulators, <laughs> this page is kind of crazy. There's like 120 different emulators you can download or something crazy like that. If they're all listed there, have fun. <laughs> but uh, let's start talking about the thing that I really wanted to talk about which is responsive layout building techniques. Um, I know all of you guys know about you, your, your masters at CSS. You can push, uh, uh, you can float stuff. You can do crazy stuff with CSS. But talking about building techniques, it, there's a difference between having the right tools and knowing how to use them, right? So even though you know the how to float stuff, uh, I really feel like there's, it's important to start thinking about the way that you do that and defining the techniques and naming the techniques so that you can go, hey, I can build it this way. Hey, I can build it that way because I know my craft. I'm you know, sort of apprenticed and I've learned my craft. And I want to talk about building techniques for building responsive designs. And the first thing I want to talk about, though, is, is adding classes to your HTML is it's not going to work anymore, right? So you've got 960 Blueprint, all of these uh, sort of traditional desktop-based layout builders. And the way that they work is you add some extra classes to the particular elements, and they sort of magically float them and, and put position them exactly the way you want inside a grid. This doesn't work anymore because you've got a single source with four different layouts on it. Which class are you going to stick on the second element in your page? Right? Because it needs four different classes. <laughs> so CSS has really failed us here tremendously. There's just no way, there's no way to fix this in CSS. Fortunately, SAS, a CSS preprocessor, can solve this problem for you. And the way that uh, CSS, who here? 
uses CSS preprocessors, just whether you're less or SAS. Who here has sort of heard about preprocessors and know the general idea? Good, excellent. So, yeah, so, so as a CSS processor, you can, you can write some, some uh, for example, in SAS, you can write a mixin and apply it to the one class that you have on that element. And uh, you can apply different, uh, you can use the, uh, uh, the same, same, yeah, the sort of the same selector in different media queries. Um, and it does a great job. Of, and Zen Grids, um, I'm actually giving a boff about, this is a compass extension to SAS that I wrote that makes it really, really easy to apply layout to a particular element. Um, if you've ever looked at Zen's default layout, it's crazy complicated, and I'm sorry. <laughs> I really am. Um, but the SAS allows you to abstract that, right? So you hide all of those crazy negative margins and stuff behind a really easy abstracted layer where you just see the, the, the you know, in this case, Zen grid item, and then I want to position it in the first column, and I want it to span two grid columns. So it says Zen grid item one comma two. Like it's really, really simple. Once you get to learn the syntax, it's much easier to see how your layout's being built using Compass, using SAS, using less than it ever will be if you try to build it using CSS. Right now, uh, we just finished putting the, the, the CSS uh, responsive design on Stark. It's a really short file, and it's also really hard to read and figure out what's going on, even though it's really simple, because it's not abstracted at all. It's raw CSS, and you know, all the different floats or position resets, and it gets complicated very fast, and it's hard to remember where you are just using CSS. I highly recommend if you're doing responsive layouts, learn SAS. Um, so what are some of the, the building techniques we can use? Content first. Uh, I'm going to present uh, six or seven different building techniques here. And uh, the first one is content first. Uh, hopefully this is, this is obvious, right? This is your, this is your mobile layout, the, the mobile first. You put your content first and sort of the, the main, uh, main, main point of the page at the top and any sort of supporting content goes after that, right? It's essential that you start with this technique because all the other building techniques sort of rely on this semantic ordering of your content. Uh, the first rule, so the first real rule I'm going to talk about is the Jason sibling rule. Um, and basically what this means is here, so we've got a grid here and we're sort of laying out, this is the, the source ordering. This is, these numbers represent the source ordering of these particular elements and uh, sort of the natural, you know, we're floating them uh, using whatever grid technique we was. Because these techniques don't just apply to Zen grids, they apply to any technique that that you want to use. You can use it, you could even use like uh, 960 blueprint or, or yeah, blueprint to do something like this. Um, so we're doing a traditional one, two, three, four, uh, and then what the adjacent sibling rule says is that each inside a row of grid items, they have to be next to each other in the source order. They have to be adjacent siblings in the source order. But within those adjacent siblings, you can actually rearrange stuff, right? So this second row, we put five over here, six, seven, eight. We've rearranged them. But as long as they're next to each other in the source order, this is possible, right? The thing that we can't do is, for example, uh, move six up into this row and have it be over here because it's not adjacent to one, two, three, four, there's you know, five in between it. So they're no longer adjacent. This is what adjacent sibling rule means. Um, the way that you, you can do this with like the uh, uh, Blueprint GS, for example, if you're familiar with that, um, there's the push and pull classes. Um, 
you could do it that way. So like five would be here, and then you sort of push it over here. And six would be naturally here, and you push it over. I don't know which way it is. Maybe seven and pull. I don't know. But that's how you rearrange it. And it's based on the adjacent sibling rule. Next is the opposing float. Um, in, in this diagram here, uh, one, two, four, and five are actually floated left, and number three is floated right. And this is how we get a particular grid item to span multiple rows, is using opposing floats. So float left, float left, float this one right, and then clear this one on the left. Since it's only clearing things floated on the left, it will clear both of these elements and ignore this one which is floated right. Opposing floats. So you're able to alternate left and right and have items that span multiple rows. And you can actually get really complicated and do something like this. So the left, these are floated left still. This is floated right. This item is uh, it's adjacent to four. Um, and it's floated, what is it floated? It's, oh yeah, it's floated right, but it's clearing left. Actually, I should say four is clearing left. One, two, four is clearing left, so it clears these two, which are floated left. It's also floated left. Five is floated right, and since it's adjacent to four, it's in that same row. It doesn't need any clearing on it. It's just floated right like number three is. And then we can do another clear left here to create a new row and just have that you know, be pushed over to the other side there. You can use opposing floats in these very complicated ways to get really sort of interesting layout techniques that are all based on the previous rules that are selected. Opposing floats, adjacent rules, semantic source ordering. Let's look at the lasso technique. Uh, lasso technique, oops, that's the wrong one. I have got the wrong slide up there. Lasso. I know exactly where this is, sorry. Let's, uh, and we do it that way. Sorry about this. Okay. Lasso technique. Um, basically, it's putting a wrapper around uh, a couple of adjacent elements, right? So we've positioned this element and the wrapper and number four inside our grid. And then two and three are just sort of naturally, they're sort of nested inside the lasso, right? And this allows us to really easily create this more interesting layout where these two particular pieces of items are sort of stacked on top of each other and uh, the other items are floated and sort of appear to be spanning below this other row. Um, yeah. Now let's go back to the slides. And yeah. There's a corset variant of the lasso rule, right? And that basically is okay, we're going to put a wrapper around this, and then no wrapper around this, and then wrap around this. If you sort of imagine this sort of white box as your viewport, you're using the, the corset here to constrict the layout of these elements. And then you can sort of have this breakout in the middle there where suddenly you, know, you, can, like, you can keep this restricted to some percentage of your viewport and then this have be 100% of your viewport. And it creates a really interesting dynamic with white space where these, you know, like you can put a carousel there or something, right? Um, this is using two lassos around these, uh, uh, around these other elements. Um, and because you always have to have exceptions to the rules, this is the absolute exception, which is the absolute exception to the adjacent sibling rule. If you remember the adjacent sibling rule, I said that for everything in a single row, they have to be next to each other inside the HTML source. The absolute exception is, of course, that you can use absolute positioning, right? But you have to use it in a very controlled way. So one, two, three, four, five, and we've taken number six and put it over here on the right side. And because it's absolute positioned, we can't guarantee, you know, how far is this going to go? I don't know, right? Um, but you, it, knowing your content, for example, here, that's a, quite a bit of content over here. If we just leave space 
over here. We can absolutely position it and put it over there. And then we create this way of making an exception to the rule of what things have to be next to each other inside the row. And when you start thinking about all of these rules together, you realize that uh, the content first, mobile first, semantic ordering of your content is really essential. But there can be a little bit of wiggle room, right? Because there's some fields where they're both sort of equally important. They're like some extra fields like the, the team members and, and maybe uh, um, the team members on a project, for example, if you had a project page and, and uh, you know, how many sodas they drank or something, right? It doesn't really matter which order in the semantics those are listed per se. So you can list them one way in the semantic ordering and as you start to build your layouts, if you need to switch those around, you still can. Um, and just remember all the building techniques that you have. One last thing. This is the violator. Um, this is actually a really simple technique. You can break the grid. By breaking the grid, you've created some, some visual interest, right? Suddenly, this number two really pops out because you've aligned it to this sort of half grid space. Um, and, and this can be a really important technique when you're building grid sites. One of the things that I see too often with grid designs is that they absolutely are inside the grid no matter what. <laughs> it doesn't have to be that way. Using the violator, you can create some visual interest. Um, using, for example, the grid, uh, Zen grids that I've created, uh, when, you, when you specify, for example, the column, that, the grid column that you want a particular element to specify, instead of just saying, you know, first column or second column, you can say 2.5. And it'll position it at the second and a half spot in your grid. This is a really important technique. Uh, and I really, I, I hope that you can use these techniques in order to have great, awesome websites. And I want, I want everybody to go out and try this at home. So thank you. Um, we're going to do. Uh, Questions and answers now. Uh, so if you w got a question, you can go up to the uh, front here. And of course, uh, there's a survey here um, to fill out and talk about how well I did or how poorly. Um, and uh, just go ahead and uh, fill that out when you get a chance. Uh, let's start right here okay. with questions. Uh, so I'm just wondering if you want fences to be in core. Uh, the question is, do I want fences in core? Um, Maybe. Um, right now, uh, JSON is running the HTML5 initiative. Um, I feel like this technique is very powerful and also really simple at the UI level. It could be a solution that we look at and build. Um, and uh, I, I'm not opposed to it. Next. Uh, how does uh, fences differ from the semantic fields module? Uh, from which Semant module? Semantic fields. Semantic fields. So yeah, we did look at some other modules before we built the fences module. Um, and some of them, and I, I can't remember the specifics of semantic fields. There's a, there's a couple of them that basically the UI is much more complicated than it needs to be. You specify the wrapper. Like it takes the, the field TPL from core and just makes each of those wrappers be configurable. You don't need every single one of those fields to be configurable, right? You just need to have like one wrapper. So that it's giving you a UI for three wrappers and you have to type in exactly what you want. And you know, with, with fences, it gives you the exact HTML5 list. So you, can, you can learn about new elements by looking through that list, right? And you pick what you want. It's really simple UI. Uh, and, and also, some of them actually are applying the semantics at the display mode or the view mode. Uh, so you actually have to reconfigure it for every single view mode that you create. Fences adds the configuration inside the field 
you know, editing settings itself so it's used for every single view mode. So that's the differences. Next. Um, can you go over the natural versus unnatural device breakpoint thing one more time? Because both those seem to me the same, so I don't so, quite uh, understand. Unnatural breakpoints are device breakpoints because you shouldn't be thinking about your site in terms of devices. You should be thinking about your site in terms of content and your design. Your design has sort of natural breakpoints that it wants you to find. And it's begging you to find them, right? So that's the differences. Don't think about the devices. Think about what your design is telling you. Uh, just to piggyback on that a little bit, on, on natural versus natural breakpoints, uh, we've come up with a lot of cases where uh, they, we want to, want to serve different content or, or, or change the markup based on, uh, I don't want to say the device, but I guess it would be smaller devices, seeing different markup. What is the best practice for that currently? Um, so uh, in the Drupal 8 in, uh, mobile initiative, we're making sure that Drupal it, can support all of the different ways of building stuff. Actually, Luke, Luke Rybluski talks about RES, which is responsive design plus server-side components. And basically is you start with the responsive design uh, and then you, you, if there's certain device criteria, uh, you uh, sort of, you, you don't look at the device itself, you look at the properties of the device, right? And based on those sort of different properties, you can tweak the markup just slightly using server-side components. This is possible with Drupal, but you have to, it, it's a very advanced technique because Drupal caches these pages per anonymous user. There's also proxy caching. So there's a lot of caching involved. You have to be very careful. You can write a custom cache uh, methodology for Drupal that overrides the default caching method uh, that allows you to have, you know, uh, one set of markup that gets cached for these device uh, properties and another set for different properties. That's the uh, theoretical way, best way to do it. Uh, it's very advanced. Uh, first off, thank you for all your work on Zen and all the work you continue to do. Um, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I was curious uh, as to your opinion is um, between SAS, LESS, and other CSS preprocessors, why'd you pick SAS over the others? Um, the reason why I picked SAS over LESS, for example, um, was uh, because of the project maturity, really. Um, SAS has been around a lot longer. Yes, LESS did come in and sort of kick SAS in the pants and say, hey, look, this syntax is a lot better. And SAS said, okay, you're right. So it created this new CSS. SCSS syntax within SAS, which is now the default syntax, by the way. So the syntax is very similar between SAS and LESS. But um, within, if you choose SAS, there is this extra project called Compass. Uh, Compass is kind of like, um, it, it does two things. Uh, one is that it, it's a library of pre-configured mixins. So there's a bunch of mixins for like CSS3. So you, you never have to write a vendor prefix again because you just use this one mixin for you know box sizing, for example, and it just writes, it compiles to the CSS that includes all of the different vendor prefixes that you happen to need for that property. So you don't have to research, okay, which device prefixes do we need? You know, this whole blow up that we had about a month ago about vendor prefix and whether they're good or bad within the you know, web development community, that's, it's a non-issue for a SaaS developer because we just write a mix in and it does all that stuff for us and it includes Opera, which is, you know, and it, it doesn't just do Safari prefixes or WebKit prefixes, it does all of the prefixes. So it, it's the maturity of Compass that made me pick SaaS over less. Plus, I just think it's completely insane that they added this whole JavaScript thing where you can do less compilation from within the browser. Like, why would you? <laughs> I know it's just for the development, but it, it really slows down site performance and makes it things kind of wonky. So anyway. Uh, you're, you're using uh, SAS for uh, the uh, different class names uh, for different viewports. Would it also be possible to use uh, media queries? for that purpose? Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure if I understand the, the I'm using SAS, uh, I'm, I'm using SAS, so basically what SAS does, it doesn't create class names. It, 
it no. uh, adds in groups of properties, right? So uh, you can use a SAS mixin on a particular selector, and that can be inside a media query just fine. And, and actually, if you use SAS, there's an interesting technique where you can actually put a media query inside the sort of nested rules of SAS. This is a slightly advanced technique in SAS. But basically, um, it's smart enough to know, OK, I just put this media query deeply or, you know, nested inside this. I'm going to pull it out to the top like CSS requires it to be. And then it rewrites the CSS appropriately. So did that answer your question? OK, great. <laughs> Uh, what would you recommend for handling basically bigger navigation structures and hierarchical navigation structures on like a small screen? Because I've seen like w to, in order to avoid a lot of duplicate markup and display none, it seems like you have to use JavaScript almost. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so, oh, so the question was um, what what techniques can you use to avoid du having duplicate markup in order to have different types of navigation based on mobile or your desktop, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, I, I feel like uh, you can combine the absolute exception rule with your, you know, uh, semantic <clears throat> with your semantic ordering in order to achieve something that works relatively well. For example, you, you put your content first, and then the navigation directly after it in the source order. So inside mobile, it, it's sort of, you can have like a, a, a link at the very top that says go to navigation and it'll scroll right, right down to the navigation which is right after your content, right? Because those are the two most important things on your site, the actual content and then some navigation to get to the other place. That's one way you can handle uh, mobile navigation. And then on the desktop side, you can use absolute positioning and pop that up to the very top. Works. That's one way. There are other ways, but that's one I like. I guess kind of a follow-up to that is um, I recently did a, a Zen Could you speak up just a little bit? Sorry. Uh, I recently did a Zen-based responsive design trying to have absolutely no fixed width anything in it. Um, and the main thing that I ran into was navigation coming last source order and ever putting it up at the top. So not just moving columns with negative margins, but putting it way up at the top and end up having to do JavaScript <laughs> on desktop, so desktops bore the burden, but to actually to move the source order. How does um, Zen Grids deal with that, or what would be your idea of a best practice to do that? Well, uh, Zen Grids, for example, doesn't actually ha have a mix-in for the absolute exception, uh, because it's it just doesn't have one. It's, it's, it's a grid-based system. It has the, uh, the violator because it's part of the grid, but the absolute is basically you, you're making room somewhere to absolute precision something. It's not complicated CSS to do that, so there's not a mix-in provided to do that. Um, and uh, you're absolutely right. You need to avoid fixed size anything inside of responsive design because as you do different sizes, you know, those those fixed size ads, for example, that are sitting over there in the sidebar are going to screw things up. Um, so you should really try to avoid um, fixed sizes at all possible. Um, without, the, so uh, without the absolute, I mean, without knowing what the height of anything is, yeah. positioning to the, you know, absolute positioning to the top falls apart. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. If you're not sure exactly how tall your header is going to be, you do need to use some JavaScript because you can't, you don't don't necessarily know. Um, the best you can do is use like position uh, relative on a wrapper that happens to be below the variable variableness of your header area, and then you can sort of pop it to you know top zero. It's tricky. Hi, uh, I work for a large organization that has uh, dozens and in some cases hundreds of sites with. Uh, the Zen theme is the basis for the look, and um, and there's a big push for the responsive design, and uh, and some of them want to switch to another theme. What can I go back and tell them? Because I really want to stay with Zen. What can I tell them and say, hey, I want to stay with Zen? Uh, um, I think that. I promise I will release at least an alpha version of Zen, of Zen 5, by the end of the weekend. 
at, at the latest. So people are, you know, there's like a long thread on groups.drupal.org about what's the best responsive base theme to use. And like nobody's picking Zen because Zen 3 just, it isn't responsive, it's fixed width, right? So they don't even know, they're not looking at the dash dev version yet. So once we have sort of an official release out there, it's some, suddenly something you can sort of look at. We're, I'm really close, and there are a bunch of people who are helping out too, but we're really close to like having it already. And, and like I said, the reason why it's taken so long is because I, I made the fences module because I couldn't do fields inside Zen. I, I, I started adding SAS because I realized that the layouts structure sucked. Zen grids in order to make building the layouts really easy because the CSS for doing layouts is complicated and with responsive layouts you have multiple more complicated CSS. So I wanted something even simpler. So I went down all these sort of tangents in order to get those fixed in order to have a really easy Zen release uh, that's responsive. Uh, we, the thing that I did last week was adding normalize, um, porting that over to SAS and then making a Drupal port of the SAS port, or actually a compass port I made, and then I did a, Zen, or a Drupal port of the compass port, and now I've added that into, to, I've carried like four different projects just to, <laughs> to get to the place we need to be for Zen, and there's so much awesomeness in the fifth version. I'm really excited about it. Um, the, I'm going to have a boff about the, the Zen grid SAS mixes, but you can also ask me questions about Zen 5 as well. That's at 5 o'clock today in one of the boff rooms. So um, I've been told to wrap it up here. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it.